Uh, so my wife Shonda did the welcome today, and if you were here for the welcome, she showed you that video of her when her car uh, decided to get a little cray cray. And uh, before we knew there was a video, it maybe you gave in after the welcome. A couple weeks back, Shonda sent me down and said, hey, I need to confess something to you. And whenever your wife says that, you're like, uh, what's going on? And she says, I was at the shop. I was really tired. Uh, she's work hard. She doesn't know how to take Sabbath. I always give her a hard time about that. I'm like, this is the reason you take Sabbath. But anyways, uh, take a day off. She, uh, she said, I got out of the car. I was so tired. She said, I walked up to the door to open it up, and suddenly out of the corner of my eye, I saw something black, and it was my car. It decided to follow me. And we're sitting there. She had gotten out and left it in drive and just bebopped up to the door. And, and thank God she didn't get run over. I said, okay, after my initial shock, when I was like, well, thank God you didn't get run over. You know, you weren't paying attention. It could have just mowed you down all at five miles an hour, but... But the funny thing was, after that, then we both looked at each other at the same time and went, I bet it's on your security camera. And sure enough, it was. So I'm hoping I can maybe make it on America's Funniest Home Video or something with that. I don't know. But, uh, but you know, maybe you've had a year like that where it's just been crazy for you and you are sort of ready to put uh, 2019 in the bag. Maybe you've had a great year. Maybe you're like, whoa, great year, and you're wanting to repeat it next year. But maybe it's, it's been a tough year, and, and you're like, I'm going to make some changes in the new year. Uh, you're like, I'm going to make some New Year's resolutions. I, I, just, I, I didn't do this for a service, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a little bit of a risk here. Uh, any of you guys made any New Year's resolutions? Would you be brave enough to raise your hand if you have? Nobody's made any news resolutions. All right, then you're a very mature crowd. I'm just going to stop preaching now. Well, that's good because I'm about to give you a statistic. One guy told me, he said, I kill my New Year's resolutions. I said, why? He said, uh, I don't worry. He told me in first service afterwards. He said, I've just decided in the new year I can't do nothing about the weather. And I'm like, oh, it's such a dad joke. But anyways, not 90, 92% of New Year's resolutions don't get done. Only 8% of the resolutions we make uh, come to completion. Now, I'm going to put that in a little perspective for you. Uh, Juilliard is a uh, school for artists and dancers and stuff. They have an 8% acceptance rate. So, your chance of getting your resolutions done is the same chance of you being in the nutcracker. Okay? So, put that in perspective. So, uh, but hey, you got to make goals though. You got to make goals, but maybe not the resolutions. But what we're going to do today, we're starting a two week series called What's Next. Uh, we're going to look at what, uh, what's next? What, what's coming up? What can we do in the new year to literally put the past behind us and walk into this new season that God has for us as individuals and even, even as a church? Uh, we're going to look at that next week. But today it's just for us as individuals. And to do that, we're going to look in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And while you turn there, let me give you a little background of Isaiah. Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet. He prophesied uh, during, in Judah, which was the southern kingdom of Israel. It's where the city of Jerusalem was at. He prophesied the Babylonians were taking uh, the people off to captivity. He would prophesy about them returning to the land, their temple getting rebuilt, all that good stuff. But most importantly... Isaiah was a prophet that prophesied about Jesus. But in what we're going to look at today, he actually gives us, there's some principles. There's some principles as he talks about some new things he's going to do in Israel. Some principles that we can use as we walk into our new year. And uh, here's the thing I want you to get. You might want to write this down. Your past does not have to be your pattern. What's the idea we're going to work off of today? A lot of times we think that our past, the patterns that we've built into our life, are, are what determines our future. But you can break those patterns through God's grace. Jesus is, a, is all about transforming us. I mean, He breaks the pattern of sin and makes us new creations. And so, in the same way, your past, this last year was hard, doesn't need to determine your upcoming year. Or the past decade, if it was hard, doesn't need to... Up come, uh, determine the new season you're in. So your past doesn't have to be your pattern. 
And we're going to look at that in Isaiah and see why that is. Um, if you've got a Bible, if not, you can just look on the screen. Isaiah 42, and we're going to start with verse 8. And uh, look, what he, look at what Isaiah has to say. He says, I am the Lord, and that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Now, let's stop there and get what he's saying. Uh, chapter 42, actually on Christmas Eve, I preached out of some other verses in chapter 42 of Isaiah. And this is a chapter pointing to Jesus. Uh, Isaiah is prophesying earlier in the chapter. He prophesies about uh, Jesus, how he'll come, he'll set captives free and all that. But then in the middle of that, God makes a reminder to this nation because they have been chastised by God because they've forsaken their covenant to him. They've been hauled off in captivity. They've given up a lot of their faith. And then God reminds them, he says, I'm the Lord. I'm the one in control. I'm sovereign in your life. And then he says, he reminds them, he says, I will not share my glory with anything else. And that, that makes sense. Some people would hear that and maybe you're not a believer and say, well, your God seems pretty narcissistic. But you've got to understand that if God is indeed God, the most supreme being in the universe, the creator, the sustainer of all things, then he alone deserves glory. He alone deserves worship. And he goes on in the verse and he, he reminds them. Notice something he says here. He says, I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. That's the biggest problem with humanity is that we love, we love to substitute God with other things that can never measure up. And we call those things idols. And so here he's reminding them, hey, you fell into idolatry. I'm chastising you for that. But I'm going to make a way out. I'm going to do some new things. I'm going to bring about your redemption. I'm going to bring about and bring you back to the land. But remember, I don't take second place in your life. And when I think about that, when I look at that verse, it reminds me of something. If, if my past doesn't need to, is not, if I don't want my past to determine my pattern for my future, then the first thing I need to make sure I'm doing in the upcoming year is this. I need to realign my priorities. Because here, God is making a statement that He is, should be the central focus and priority of these Israelites' life. And by extension, if you're a Christian, you follow Jesus, then in that same vein, God should be the central priority in your life. Now, a lot of times, you know, if you're a believer, we give lip service to that. We say, hey, I have a relationship with Christ. God is important to me. But we give lip service to it. We say that, but then when we dig into our life, we dig into how we spend our time. We dig into what motivates us. We dig into how, what we spend our money on. We dig into just all aspects of our life. What we think about. What we dream about. And suddenly if we're honest. If we take an inventory and we're honest. God is often not our priority. And we need to realign it. We need to shift it. I'm not saying that you can't have good things in this life. All good things come from God. There's lots of gifts we can have. But don't make those things the reason for your existence, if you have been given the gift of salvation by God, you're being changed into a new creation. And he has to be the center and focus of your life because you understand that a relationship with him is the greatest gift you have in your life. Everything else that we can achieve in this life, though it's good and great and grand, pales in comparison to knowing the creator of your very being and existence who loves you enough to have a relationship with you. Something to think about. You know, one way I look at this, you know, I was thinking about this myself, is I realized I needed to make some realignments in my life because I needed to make some small uh, tweaks to get big peaks in my life. And so uh, one thing that I'm bad to do when I wake up in the morning is I grab my phone before I ever get out of bed. And I was really bad. The first thing I would do is I would get on Facebook and see what all y'all are up to. And look through all the crazy memes and crazy stuff and see all your posts. And, and then I would go over and I would read the news. I would go to four or five different news things. All the way from conservative, liberal, all over because I like to have a good thing. But I suddenly realized something. I'm like, this is not a good way to start your day, dude. Because later on in the day, I would get down to my Bible reading. First thing I did was uh, off the advice of my, my daughter and my son-in-law is I decided that in the new year, I'm going to stop starting my day off reading the news. 
because it's kind of depressing. And I was really bad to go to bed with like political podcasts on, so I'd go to bed listening to political podcasts and wake up in the morning in a bad mood. And so I killed those. I'm not doing that no more. And I stopped getting on Facebook first thing in the morning. I said, you know what? You don't got to get out of the bed and go get your Bible. You got a Bible on your phone. It's got a Bible app. So, instead of looking at cat memes first thing, or baby Yoda memes, because that's taking the internet by storm. Uh, and if you've not watched The Mandalorian, you should. And those of you who aren't Star Wars fans, you'll get it one day when you go to heaven. But, uh, <laughs> but instead of doing that, I open up the Bible app, and I'm just like, I'm going to read my Bible first. And I've, been, I've, I've started that a couple weeks back, and I've been pretty consistent with it. And it's so much better. I just read a chapter in my Bible. I just read a chapter in the Bible app, and then I got this commentary on Kindle on my phone. I go and read it, and it's just a better way to start my day. And you know what it also does, though? It subtly helps me to remember what my priority is as I start my day and whatever, all kinds of craziness or whatever's going on. So you may need to realign your priorities. You may need to take a look at things in your life and say, okay, what have I subtly allowed to take first place over my relationship with my Creator? What do I need to change? What needs to shift so that I put God first place again? And next week we're going to look at some next steps that you can do uh, to, to do that, to help with that part, go a little deeper in that. But then notice he goes on in the verse. He tells him he's God. And look what he says here in verse 9. He says, see the former things have taken place. He's reminding them all the big things he's done in the past. But then look at what he says. And new things I declare. God is always about doing some new things. He moves in new ways. And he says, before they spring into being, I announce them to you. And so it's kind of the idea of God saying, hey, even before like a plant comes up out of the ground, before it even uh, uh, begins to materialize, I let you know ahead of time what I'm about to do. He's telling these people. I'm, and matter of fact, this whole book is a prophecy. He was letting them know what he was about to do. But then look what he says in verse 10. This is so good. And a lot of churches need to like live by this verse. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the ends of the earth. You who get down to the sea and all that's in it. You islands and all who live in them. And then he goes on and talks about all kinds of places all over the world. But the point is, the point is he's saying there, sing a new song to the Lord. The idea there is, okay, is we, we can... Uh, celebrate not just the past but celebrate our blessings now and that's another thing that we need to do we need to celebrate our blessings as we enter into this new year celebrate what God's done but celebrate what he's doing and celebrate what he's going to do and see the problem is a lot of times we get uh, so wrapped up in living in the past and living in some movement that God did in our life 10 years ago that we don't celebrate what he's doing right now and we get so fixated, we're not willing to live in the change that God's going to bring about. That's why he says, sing a new song. And so you need to celebrate your blessings. See, the problem is, though, a lot of times we go through a tough season. Maybe this year's been a tough year. And we get so focused on the negative that we're unable to see the positives that are still going on around us, even though we may be in one of the hardest years of our life. You know, I started something uh, last year that's helped me to see that because um, for far too often I could get where I would just focus on the negative and not the positive. And, and so I thought I need to be mindful of the good that's going on in my life. And I think I shared this before, but I want to share it again. So I started this thing where every day, I don't get it done every day because, you know, I'm not perfect. We're going to talk about perfectionism in a minute. But I write down a list of five things that I'm grateful for. And I'm not talking about big grandiose things like sometimes they are. Sometimes God does some big things in my life and of course I'm thankful for those. But it can be little things. I mean just small things. You know at least once a week I write down family members. I write down my wife. And she's probably sitting there going why don't you write me down every day. But you know you, you write down different things. I mean one day it was Tuesday. I got tacos at the taco truck. I wrote down I'm thankful for tacos gift from God but but you write down the small things and you know what that does you begin to see 
the blessings and all the things that are good in your life. And you begin to metaphorically be able to sing a new song. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you just thank God for the simple things in your life? I mean, we're real big about asking Him for stuff. When's the last time you just took the time to say, thank you, God? To be thankful for those little things. Maybe you're like, you have a hard time figuring what those are at. Well, sit down every day. Maybe do this. Just say, hey, I'm going to write down five things I'm grateful for today. Sometimes I get silly and I alliterate them. I mean, it might be like tacos and Tuesdays and I don't know another T word. I'm not sure. One day it was Shonda, Slurpees, and Sweet Tarts. I don't know. But hey, they're great. My life seems to revolve around food and my wife. I just realized that. <laughs> As I was talking to y'all. <laughs> Maybe I know what my New Year's resolution needs to be. But what are you grateful for? What do you thank them for? What do you went to him in prayer and thank them for? Even in the midst of hard times, there are still blessings that if we'll have the eyes to see them, are there. And so that's what he's saying. Then he goes on, if you were to go over to chapter 43, a little farther. Here's a great verse that he says here. Isaiah 43, 18. Listen to what he says here. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Wow. Some of us need to like have that verse plastered all over our houses, on our car window, uh, tattooed on our hand. Forget the former things, do not dwell in the past. In the context of here, what he's saying is, he's talked about what he did when he freed the Israelites from the Egyptians. You go back and you read in the Old Testament book of Exodus, they are fleeing the Egyptians, they're chasing the Israelites, they're getting ready to go into the wilderness, and they cross the Red God miraculously does a miracle, parts the waters of the Red Sea, they go across. When the Egyptian army goes to chase them, they enter into the ocean and the waves crash down and destroy them and Israel's set free. And that's big in their history. Big movement of God. And God's like, I did this, but he says, stop focusing on that because I'm about to do something new. And, and you see, that's something we need to understand. Focus on the present, not the past. If you don't want your past to be your pattern, stop focusing on the past. You see, positive or negative, we get so fixated. In a positive light, we'll get so fixated on something God did 10 years ago that we don't see the new thing He's trying to do now. And that's what these Israelites were doing. He was saying, hey, you think you know what I'm about to do. You think I'm going to come through and move like I did in Egypt. But God is like, I'm going to do something totally different different I'm going to move in a different way the ultimate totally different thing he would do to set them free is he would send Jesus when Jesus came the people when he was born expected for a, a political leader to come and set them free from Roman oppression but Jesus came to do something much greater he didn't come to set up an earthly limited kingdom he came to set up an eternal kingdom and not just to set Israel free, but to set the world free from their sins. He came to do that for you and he came to do that for me. God moved in a totally different new way than what they were expecting. And he's still doing it today. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. But God is still moving and working in your life and my life. Sometimes the way he worked in the past may not be the way he works in your future or in your present. And you need to be ready to focus and walk in to whatever it is God is trying to do in your life in the new season that you might find yourself in. I know a lot of times we don't like change. People hate change. But if you're going to follow the Lord, you need to embrace change. Because God is going to bring some changes in your life. Because that's called growth. That's how we grow. And so that's, you know, if you don't want your past to be your pattern, be open and willing to allow God to make some changes in your present and your future. Now there's one thing that you've got to avoid in all this. There's one thing that's the enemy to you moving ahead. And it's this little word. 
that a lot of us struggle with. It's called perfection. Perfectionism. You say, what's wrong with perfectionism? Perfectionism is not trying to do the best I can. I get that. But you've got to understand, there's only been one perfect God, and He died for humanity, and you're not Him. And a perfectionistic mindset means that even though we are doing good things, they're never good enough. John Acuff wrote a great book that I tell everybody they need to read at least once in their life. It's called Finish by John Acuff. That's A-C-U-F-F. It's called Give Yourself the Gift of Done. It's all about finishing what you start. And he has a great quote in there. He says, perfectionism magnifies your mistakes and minimizes your progress. You're trying to follow God's call in your life. You're trying to grow as a person. You may have goals for your life, goals for different areas of your life. And you're doing it all for the glory of God. It can be health goals. It can be family goals. It can be work goals. It can be church goals. It can be personal goals. And you're trying to grow in those things. But, but your perfectionism won't allow you to start or finish the things that God may want to do in your life. Because you don't think that what you're doing in the moment is good enough. You see, for a perfectionist, they're hard not only in themselves, but the people around them. A perfectionist could have one of the greatest days ever. They could do something really big. Maybe they're, they're in church work. Maybe they're a pastor like me. They could preach a, a great sermon or have a great worship service that really touches people. But a perfectionist will overlook all the good that was done and focus on the one thing that they did wrong. Any of y'all relate to that? And the problem with that is is it sabotages your growth because if you're that bent that way, you'll never jump out and risk anything. <laughs> or you'll never start because you don't think that it's good enough. You won't put yourself out there because you'll think that people around you are better at it than you are when you just need to do it. And I, I get this. It, that used to be me. There was a season when we first started church, you know, I was very perfection-minded. We, we had some amazing things going on, but I would be so focused on the one thing we did wrong that I didn't get to, you know, be joyful in the blessing of what was going on. And finally, you know, God's got me out of that. Thank you, Lord, for that. Maybe you're here today, and that's what you struggle with. My prayer for you in the new year is that you'll learn how to deal with it. A good place to start is to get the book finished by John Acuff. I get nothing for that push, by the way. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't, but anyways. If you're watching, John, I like free stuff. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What's your one big thing in the upcoming year? That one thing that you just would really like to see change? It's something maybe you've dealt with in the past. You feel like it, you don't want it to be a pattern in your future. What is that one thing? What is it? What are you willing to do to see the change? Could it be, okay, that the first thing you need to do is realign your priorities and start to put God in the center? Because then you might find something subtle might happen. That what you thought was so important that you needed to achieve or have suddenly doesn't seem so important anymore. Because as you got closer and closer to the Lord, that big goal, you're like, isn't really lining up with God's priority for your life. And He might change what your big thing is. And then if you're on the footing where you're like, God is really your priority and you're trying to walk as close as you can with Him, and He's given you something, then know this, okay, know this. He's up to doing new things, so trust Him in the process, and just set out and start, start to go for it, man. And don't let a perfectionist mindset keep you from walking into the blessing that God may be wanting to do. You might see some progress in the new year. And you may find that your old pattern doesn't have to be your future. So, we've, hey, we've looked at this. We've looked at some words today about what's next. And just remember this. 
Your past doesn't have to be your pattern. You don't have to be defined by the mistakes of your past. You can walk free and in God for a future that He has for you. He's not done with you. You just got to trust Him and walk in it and live in it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, as we uh, are on the back end of another year, uh, before we ask anything, we want to do what we talked about. We want to celebrate. We want to thank you, Lord, for your blessings. I pray that each of us right now, God, would just maybe think of that. Think of the good you've done in our life, and we would just say, thank you, God. We deserve nothing, and you give us so much. Thank you for that. Thank you for the small wins, the big wins that you bring into our life. And even thank you, God, for the challenges and the trials because, God, they, they make us more and more like you and they reveal the things that we need to grow in, even when they're not easy. Lord, as we look on the beginning of another year, we just pray, God, as individuals, that you will change us, you'll challenge us. For some of us, God, may this be the year when we finally... Uh, lay down our preoccupation with our past and we walk into the future you have for us. We know, Lord, that the best days are yet to come. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.